What's going on guys? This will be the start of a new series where we'll be covering exam SRM. So we've broken down into eight chapters. Each chapter will come with its own pair of notes and practice problems, which will be available in the description. So today we'll be covering the first half of chapter one. So we're gonna be covering how to describe your data, parametric versus non-parametric models, prediction versus inference models, the variance bias trade-off, and supervised versus unsupervised learning. So what is statistical learning? So statistical learning is a set of tools for understanding data. So throughout this course, we'll be able to appropriately apply different statistical tools to be able to form inferences and make predictions. So understanding your data. So these two variables on the right are what are known as quantitative variables. So quantitative means numerical. So for here we have what's known as a continuous variable, which means it can take on any real value. For instance, the temperature could be 68.0001 degrees. And on the right we have a discrete variable where it can only take on a finite set of values. In this instance, it's a count variable, which can only take on positive discrete values. And on this side, we have qualitative variables. And qualitative just meaning non-numerical. Now qualitative can be broken down into two different parts, which one being ordinal. So ordinal means there's some type of order in the data. So for instance, here we have very windy, mildly windy, and not windy, or nominal, which means there is no order, such as California, Florida, Massachusetts. So our goal is to take these four variables and guess what the temperature is going to be for that day. So here we're given the temperature because we're using past data, or the train data, which is what we're going to use to build our model. So the four variables that we're using are what are, is known as predictors, or the independent variables, and we hope to predict the dependent variable, which in this case is the temperature. And that's gonna take this uh, form. So y, which is our dependent variable, is going to equal f of x, which means we're applying some type of function to x, which is our four predictors here. And then epsilon is gonna be the random component. So f of x is also known as the systematic or reducible error. It's going to be what we're changing to try to get our best prediction for temperature. And epsilon is known as the non-systematic or irreducible error. And why, of course, is just our prediction that we're going to get from this. So here we're using what's known as train data and to build a model with these four predictors. So what we hope is in the future is that we can use these four predictors to get the temperature for what that day is going to be. And that would be the test set. So the test set, we're not given the temperature. We're just given a new set we're given the same set of variables, but new observations that we haven't seen yet. And with the f of x that we formed, we hope we can get accurate prediction for temperature for that day. Okay, so parametric versus non-parametric models. So this f of x can be either parametric or non-parametric. So parametric means it has some type of functional form. So what that would look like is something like this. So beta 0 plus beta 1x plus beta 2x2. So here the x would be temperature the day before. And the x2 might be days without rain. And we're estimating parameters to plug into this equation and hopefully get an accurate prediction. Now what non-parametric looks like, 
looks something like this. So this might be, if it's, was it over 60 degrees the day before? Um, was it over five days before it rained? Now this is non-parametric because there's no estimated parameters. We're simply plugging in an observation and we're getting a response. So this is a decision tree which we'll learn in chapter 5 and this is multiple linear regression which we will learn in chapter 2. Now regression versus classification. So we talked about the dependent variable and the independent variables whether they were numeric or categorical. But here we're going to describe the dependent variable. So before we use temperature which it would make this a regression problem. So if you're predicting a numerical value, it's known as regression. If you're predicting a non-numerical value, value or qualitative value, it's known as a classification problem. So based on what you're trying to predict, you will use different statistical learning methods or different models. For instance, you might use linear regression here, but then the counterback part for that would then be logistic regression. So prediction versus inference. So before we were predicting the weather, so that would most likely use a prediction model. So for a prediction model, you don't care how you got your result, you just want the most accurate result possible. So when you're checking your weather app in the morning, you wouldn't care that it's going to be slightly warmer because the jet stream shifted. All you care is that they get the most accurate result possible. Now for inference models, which generally aren't as accurate, but you're able to draw more conclusions from your data. So for instance, if we're predicting the lifespan of a person based on four variables, whether they're a smoker, whether they exercise, their gender, and their weight. So with an inference model, we would be able to form conclusions such as if you're a smoker, you'll live five less years on average. Or if you exercise, you can live an extra 10 years on average. Uh, females generally live three years longer than males, I think it is. Now with the prediction model, you wouldn't be able to get these numbers, but you'll get a most accurate result for lifespan. Variance bias trade-off. So variance is how much our model will change if we use a new train, training set. So it's going to be how different our f of x is and y is equal to f of x plus epsilon if we use different data to train it. So for instance, if we use Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday instead of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if there's a huge difference, then it has a high variance. Now bias is how close we get our predictions to the actual values. So our goal is to minimize these two, but they are at odds. That's why it's a trade-off. So as the variance increases, we can expect the bias to decrease. But as, as the bias increases, the variance will decrease. Which brings us to our, ex our expected test mean squared error. So we're going to be able to solve for the mean squared error next video. But for now, just think of it as how close we're able to get our predictions to the actual values of data that it hasn't seen yet. So for instance, when we're looking at temperature, how close were we able to predict the temperature for the next day? And what that's going to be equal to, in theory, is the squared bias of our f of x plus the variation of our f of x plus the variation of epsilon. So our goal is to minimize this value. And how we're able to do that 
is by adjusting our model's flexibility. Now flexibility is how able our model is to follow the data. So for instance, say we're given the exact same data sets. So we're going to use age to try to predict a person's height and only using age alone. So say we just predict the height of an individual as the average height of all individuals in the training set. So that would look something like this. Now this would be what is known as the null model, which means we're simply ignoring age and we're just going to guess the average height of all the individuals. So this would be an example of a low flexibility model. And it is underfit. It's not able to follow the data well. So even if we brought in new data, it would still just get guess the mean of the old data, which doesn't really fit the trend of the data here. Now if instead our prediction line went something like this, this is what we're aiming for. So this has the right amount of flexibility and it's the perfect fit. So even if we brought it to new data that it hasn't seen yet, it'll probably generalize really well. Now if instead, what if we built a model like this, where it fits every data point of the training set. So this would not generalize to new data well, because if we get new points, they might be here, 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 and it's not accounting for that. It's just accounting for the train data and it's overfit in the data. So here we're going to have a high flexibility overfit model. Won't generalize well. So by adjusting flexibility, we can adjust the bias and variance. And again, our goal is to minimize these as much as we can, both of them. Because the test mean squared error is the square bias plus the variance. So as we increase the flexibility of our model, the bias will decrease, but the variance will increase, and the interpretability will decrease. As we decrease the flexibility of our model, the bias will increase, the variance will decrease, and the interpretability will increase. So as we increase the flexibility, we'll be able to get closer to our data points, but it won't generalize the new data as well. And as we decrease our flexibility, it won't be able to get anywhere near the observation, so the bias will increase, but the variance will decrease because it will still be able to it'll generalize better than something like this would. So mean squared error, which again, we're going to cover next video, the formula wise and how to solve for it. But for now, we still know we want to minimize it and our, our goal is to minimize it. So again, this is how close, say, if we're predicting temperature, how close we're get, able to get to the actual temperature. So as our flexibility increases, so this will be first for the train data. So this is what we're training our model on. The mean squared error will constantly decrease. So for instance, here's our train data. As our flexibility increases, it's able to get closer and closer to the data points in the train data. Train. Now for our test data, the mean squared error will decrease, but then it will start to increase again at a certain point. So the point that this happens would be the second plot here, or the perfect fit model. So this will be create the lowest test mean squared error, or it will predict observations that it hasn't seen yet the best. So anything past that point we're overfitting, which is just this here. And anything before that point, we're underfitting, which is what's happening here. 
So our goal is to adjust the flexibility so that we can lower the test mean squared error. Okay, supervised versus unsupervised. So everything we've covered so far is supervised learning. So supervised, supervised, takes the form y is equal to the f of x plus the epsilon. So here we're going to have an example of unsupervised learning. So supervised takes up about 80% of the exam, unsupervised about 20%. Okay. So unsupervised. So the difference between supervised and unsupervised is unsupervised does not have a dependent variable. So previously, say we were trying to predict the temperature, that's our dependent variable. We have a specific num or we have a specific variable that we're trying to predict. But here, in unsupervised, there is no dependent variable or certain number we're trying to predict. Instead, we're just given four variables. And the goal of unsupervised learning is generally to try to group or find um, similarities within your data. So for instance, say we're using some type of grouping algorithm, and we have these four variables, gender, their favorite activity, their hours outside a day, and their favorite class. So what our algorithm might do is it might say group one is observations two and four and group two is observations one and three. So now with these groups then we can try to form some type of analysis from it. So we might look at the data and see why do these people get in group two and four. So we can see observation two and four, they're female, they like to read, they're only outside two hours a day, and their favorite class is math. Here we have a male, they like playing video games, they're only outside one hour a day, and their favorite subject is science. So we can look at these groups and we can assign and we can say these people are say the nerds. And now if we look at observation one and three, they like sports, their favorite activity is gym class, they're outside six hours a day. They like swimming, they're outside five hours a day, and they like recess. We can say these are the jocks. Now see, all this is pretty much arbitrary here. I could assign these anything. I could have said these are actually the cool kids or the smart ones. So there's, since it can be somewhat arbitrary on supervised learning, it's hard to it's much harder to say what's a good model per se. Like in supervised, you can always just say how close you can get to the temperature is the better. You can't always do that with unsupervised learning. Okay, so that wraps up this section. Next section is going to be the math. We're going to learn plots. We're going to learn how to see how good our model is performing. And then that's about it. Hope you enjoyed.